Hello, interwebs, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Tokyo Philosophical Society. Tonight is a very, very special episode, and you want to know why? Because as uh, it's what? Monday. Ah, uh, it's Monday. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I thought you were gonna say seven, lucky seven. Yeah, yeah. Book seven. But this is this is uh, not only it's not not seven. It's kind of the rest of book seven. Yeah. Right? The part Ooh. we didn't get to. And that's going to be the topic. The remainder of Book Seven. So this is—it's like we're out of Midgar and are playing the rest of the game. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, or you know, we're almost to Mount Doom. Or actually, we got done with Mount Doom. Right. We're kind of. They're going to do like a baseball thing, like seventh inning stretch. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Actually, and like I don't know, lecture kind of mentioned this is the march down, right? Yeah. Um, kind of mentioned that we had gone up, we'd seen the good, and now we're on the way back down. Now, why why Plato thinks we need to go down? Actually, I think that's really worth thinking about in mm -hmm. itself. What, you know, what is the purpose facing, of going uh, down? Facing the the going down. Actually, I'm I'm kind of starting to feel like the guy who came out of the cave. I kind of want to stay up at the top. <laughs> 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 I'm worried about yeah. this descent. Actually, <laughs> what you you you're worried about killing everyone over ten years old? <laughs> yes. that, that that concerns you. I'm yeah, kidding. a little bit. I'd like to stay up, like looking at the sun, burning my retinas out. <laughs> actually, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. If leaving the cave means murdering everyone over ten, <laughs> I can see where you're going with that. But don't worry, we're still upwards. We're still near the top because. Yeah. We get to talk about mathematics. This I didn't is like when that... you're on the roller coaster and it's like goes right <laughs> over the top. You're like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that in a chapter that talked about mathematics, we could also talk about mass murder. <laughs> well, they kind of sound similar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're geometry, genocide. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. 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 All right, so... I actually, I'll, I'll admit it. Um, I'll, I'll be the weird guy here. I enjoyed this chapter. Um, this... <laughs> Not not the genocide part. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually enjoyed the beginning of this chapter, the part right after the cave, because that's where we talked about um, something really interesting, which I'm sorry, the Bloom translation kind of skips over or doesn't directly say, which is what I guess it's called the summoners, or mm. that's that, that which summons you your soul upward. The three fingers. Your, yeah, is the three the, fingers. Yeah. These are the three fingers, but he calls them summoners in our yeah. translation, in other words, things that summon your thoughts to more abstract thinking mm. right now. I don't know. I really enjoyed this idea. I mean, it's a very simple <coughs> premise, I think. But I just want to correct Plato, if I, if I may be so bold, it's to correct Plato. Now, he seems to suggest that when you meet, when you see two things that are both this thing and not that thing at the same time, for example. You, you mean you see one thing that yeah, appears yeah, to be two things two, at the same yeah. time. So yeah. You see one thing that appears to be one, both it and one thing and the other thing at the same, another thing at the same time, for example. He uses number here. Now, this is actually quite confusing to me. You see, you see the one or the many, right? For example, he uses as an example the hard and the soft, right? You touch something, and I guess from one perspective it can be hard, and another perspective it can be soft. Make your own jokes here. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, things with kind of contradictory properties or the possibility of contradictory properties, he says that that forces you to think about the nature of the thing itself, mm -hmm. right? So when you see, I don't know, many different kinds of tigers, I guess, um, you begin to think of tiger itself, right? Mm -hmm. The form of tiger, and the one tiger from the many tigers. Now, he seems to think that math is the skill that, that is a summoner, kind of. It makes you lift your eyes towards the abstract. I don't agree totally with this, or at the very least, I want to say, why is it only math, right? I mean, I can think, actually, of a lot of examples outside of math. In fact, it seems like... It, other topics are much better at summoning your abstract thought than math, whereas math seems to be relatively pure, right? You see one thing, and then that's it. There's no one and not one within math, right? I, th I think he's thinking more of, like, seeing the many tigers and thinking of the one tiger, and then he takes the uh, examine the difference between the one and the many. But, for example, I mean, how about this? Living in a multiracial country. Um, so you live in a multiracial country. You meet people of many different races. 
And that actually prompts you to think about what is it that makes someone man or human. Um, and then you learn to abstract from their superficial differences, skin color, and you learn to realize that they are they share a similar kind of kind to you that is the kind of mankind, right? Wh why couldn't that just as easily be a summoning kind of moment? Mm. Well, one you can't teach that. That's that's because he's, he's really this is all about education, Jenna. We do teach that though. Well, okay. in, in America, we do teach that. You're right, but all right. But he would have to have had a multiracial show, show city for this to work. Something tells me his city was not that multiracial. Well, there were other races, but they were slaves. No. <laughs> no. They were slaves. Well, I, think, <clears throat> think, I really think the reason why it was math, this was simply because this was one of the few formal studies is, that was methodically, systematically taught during his day. I mean, I, I understand his, his respect for math, which has basically this absolute objective one answer, right? No matter who you are, no matter what race you are, one plus one equals two, like we, the lecturer talked about. And I want to talk about the lecturer's idea here. But within the field of math, what on earth within the field of math would actually summon your mind to think abstractly? I mean, for example, when Plato gives this kind of bizarre idea that, like, well, looking at these fingers and stuff, or you 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 begin to think of numbers. Really? Do you think of the many? You think of numbers when you start seeing finger? I think what he thinks is you see three fingers, and then you think about finger itself per se, right? Or the many tigers leads you to the one tiger. Well, that's yeah. I guess that's kind of numbers. I was, I was going to say, like, if I were defending Plato right here, although I kind of see where you're pushing this, I just want to see if you push it more. Like, what if in your example I said, like, yeah, that's all cool, but, like, I'm going to be Plato here for a second, but, yeah, um, the reason you can do that is because of number, um, which is, like, in other words, you live in a country with many races, and you, you think you should see one man, but you see two different men, but there should be, like, one thing who is, which is man, like, and then you gotta, in your mind, in your, you, it calls to your intellect, you see two, like, a white guy and a black guy, and, like, you, you see two when there should be one, which is man, so then you gotta, like, break these two back down to one by making a more abstract concept of man, which is inclusive of both races... Yeah, I, I, I don't deny that math can be part of this. I'm just saying, why is math the only... For example, what about hard and soft? He uses that example himself. That has two qualities, and it should be one quality for one thing, because reason doesn't allow a contradiction. I'm just going to be a Plato man. I'm going to be <laughs> annoying. I'm just going to be really annoying right now. Because um, how can something be both, both moving and standing still at the same time? Yeah. So clearly, the yeah, this, this is the whole th the argument that led us to the tripartite soul, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah. I, I, I kind of see where you're going with this, Dustin. I kind of like where you're going with this more. I kind of it feels like it's so limiting when you bring it to math. Like you could easily just just as easily like paint a picture that yeah. like, questions like your daily your 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 everyday assumptions about. Well, for example, it. how about this? Duchamp's fountain. Mm. Um, he put that toilet out there as a piece of art. Okay, so that was what. It, how how about that? It's a summoning moment. So there, you're forced to you, you're you're showing a piece of art or someone that's something that doesn't look like art, and you're told it's art, thus making you question what art is itself. Doesn't well, that lead you higher and abstracter? I more think, abstract. Think, though we're forgetting a condition here. What's the condition? Are we forgetting? I mean, because it had when he's going through his study his studies. These and what he's teaching his guardians means there's two conditions. conditions. One, it summons to a higher level of intellect, and two, it's useful in war. Oh yeah, I, I know. Um, that's his, that's for his intellect. For, that's for his guardians. Yes, but um, why aren't the? I mean, when we talk about this, the the work of summoning, in other words, summoning to the oh. abstract. Well, I do admit that, again, I have a problem with him saying that they have to be useful for war. I, 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 
I don't see how on earth that is any different than having a practical use. So I'd like to hear an answer about that from Plato himself. Yeah, those stupid money changers using, using math to do practical things. We should be waging war with math. Thank you. Thank you, General Plato. <laughs> but um, that, that sounds like an awfully practical use. Now, I think he's thinking about using numbers in a kind of way to make technology, which is not just counting, I don't know, how many zenny you got that day or how many rupees you got. So you're using numbers more abstractly. But that certainly doesn't seem like you're studying numbers for the sake of number itself. It certainly sounds pretty practical, if you ask me. That's uh, because it's, that's the uh, spirit. That's not the desire, you see. So we're, we're, we're waging war in order to defend numbers against yeah. the, the evils of, I don't know. What, the number numbers? munchers? The number munchers. <laughs> the number munchers, exactly. There's like, they're on the outside of the fence. Right? They're waiting to get in. We need to wage war against those yeah. other I, things. I don't, number. I don't see why the war aspect is any less practical than... than the commerce ex aspect in some ways. Well, um, like, for example, when he talks about generals counting armies or something. I'm like, well, how is that any different than counting rupees? Um, he's obviously abstractly counting them. Look how beautiful it is that my armies are divided in this way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, uh, so I don't, I don't, I mean, like, I think Plato is, he was very Greek when he said that. He's like, yeah, we should basically be using math to think about the abstract uh, properties of the universe and uh, waging war. Um, that's why we get the expression from Plato to NATO, right? I mean, this is this is really is the, the origin of that. I, it, if anything, I could the best I can say for Plato there is he's thinking more te technology, right? Using ge geometry to use a kind of abstract technology. I don't know, but I, I, I don't see it. I don't see the reason. Yeah, all I can think is that he's says, okay, maybe there's lots of these summoners out here, here, but our guardians, they have to be philosophers and warriors. There is, so, uh, of all of these these summoners, uh, there's perhaps your art, art might be one he would consider. There, the ones we're going to let our guardians use is half to be useful for war. Or that has us starting with math. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Probably, you know, it's, it's not a good argument, I admit. <laughs> It's not a good argument. I think that might be the argument, though. Yeah, I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, like, I do like, I do like this idea. I just want to change. I want to change his idea a little bit. And first of all, I want to say that math. Okay, you kind of got me when I'm like, well, yeah, there's there's two things or many things. I'm reducing it to <laughs> one thing, which seems. I mean, like, okay, yes, I am reducing the many to one. So you kind of got me there. But within math itself, that surely doesn't happen. Right within math itself, that this when I see a two, I'm so freaked out. I'm like, that's two ones. That's got to be two ones. Otherwise, <laughs> like my mind will explode. That can't be a two, really. <laughs> it's it's one. made up of multiple ones. Okay. Well, you remember in the Tractatus where Wittgenstein made it all one plus one plus one plus one plus one. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah. you think this is what he's thinking about when he sees like when he talks about <laughs> math and then this kind of two. But within math, do the numbers have two different properties? Uh, you know what? I got you. You're using numbers to explain things in the world that have different properties. Yeah, numbers. I think that's what that's what he means. Is in the world the thing, right? Yeah, because the, the numbers themselves are are you know the form of number. Mm. There is completely pure and indivisible. Also, it, I think we only have one. Can I can I make a like an alternative suggestion to the n number? Like era, I, I think I just weird. I just feel like number just doesn't work well. What if what if I just said what if what if Plato somehow could had a machine that could see the future and he said, oh sorry, what I actually meant was the uh, principle of individuation by Schopenhauer. Oh okay, I like that. Uh, that's that's what I meant. Um, and uh, so in other words, like uh, you know when when you see like one things are things are not one, they're they're two because they're divided by space and time. But like then, then you have to work out how like their and the identity works together. Remember in the, in the, in the uh, world of small presentation, he talked about how like the principle of individuation is broken sometimes, and that's when people talk about ghosts and stuff. <laughs> you remember that? Like he said, like this is like this is this caused you to like believe in eerie things like ghosts and spirits, isn't it? Like isn't yeah, isn't yeah, it yeah. like kind of weird? Like like uh, in a way, like in a very strange way, isn't this what Plato is talking about? Like. Some some weird 
thing is it seems to be two when it should be one. You know, like like when we talked about it in our horror special, like the ghost, <laughs> like the zombie is the living dead. It should it should be one, but it's two, right? And we cannot we can't yes, get it yes, into some category. Right, and also don't zombies force you to think about what it is to be alive. I mean, that's the yeah. theme of, for example, um, a lot of these zombie comedies, Zombieland, or um, that. Um, a couple, I mean, like they, they force you to think about what is it, Dawn of the Dead, right? I mean, mm. what is it to really be living, right? Uh, so, I mean, th- again, movies like that <laughs> prompt you to the higher. So, I don't know. I like this idea a lot. This by contrasting opposites. I mean, it's a really simple idea, but by contrasting opposites, it forces you to think abstractly. This is the dialectic, isn't it? Mm. Kind of got these two abstract concepts that seem to be opposed, and then by having those two together, it forces you to think about what the nature of, for example, man or the nature of woman. Um, Plato kind of uses this argument when he talks about the equality of men and women. Mm. Right? Um, he abstracts them to the point where, well, being a woman is just simply a secondary quality. Yeah. Right. Um, so, taking this idea, and then moving that on to the lecturer's idea about math as a community. Can I do this quickly, and then? Sure. So he, the lecturer, said that math was a great sen- was a great kind of form of community. Mm. And the, he explained it by saying that, well, when you have a math problem, it doesn't matter who you are. Um, if you're black, white, Asian, gay, straight, lesbian, doesn't matter. You're always going to find the right answer. So in other words, you can have this kind of group of people of, of different origins working together to solve a problem that every one of them has equal access to. That kind of reminds me of computer science class, by the way. Um, well, I... I could not solve some of those problems, by the way, in computer <laughs> yeah, science class. Well, some yeah. of us didn't have equal access to those problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so, I'm compiling it. It's an error. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a compilation error. Um, so, I, I mean, okay, I like... It's an interesting idea. What if I were to say, and this is something that... Uh, one of my own kind of ideas I like to kick around. I think that's what the state itself does. I mean, this is the power of the state. Okay, what the state can do is to abstract people and give them rights based not on skin color or secondary qualities, for example, even sex or sexual preference, and give them rights and protection based on um, a kind of abstract idea that they are human. Right? This is the principle of our idea of equal rights. Mm. Or, like, um, I guess, I don't know how many states have actually moved to that level, by the way. Like, it, I, I think America gives the rights because you're American, not because you're human. Right? But, yeah, because but, you're a citizen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But cl- yeah. I, I'm assuming, like, we're working to get closer to that level, right? Yeah, I guess that would be, I mean, if I was a kind of conservative, I might kind of say, well... If 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 you don't want to join our community of equality, then we can't provide you with the same rights because we don't rule the world, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I guess if if I was this kind of weird statist, I might make an, an a kind of argument like that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, for for example, if I was a weird conservative, and I, I might I might partially be, but I, <laughs> if I was this weird conservative, I'd say like, okay, I'm not going to give anyone dual citizenship. You're mm-hmm. either part of my state or you're out. Mm. And um, I'm going to say, well, but but I can promise you this. Um, no dual citizenship, but I promise you that everyone's rights will be honored, um, not dependent on sexual preference, uh, race, or, or, or anything like that, um, gen- gender or anything. I will, I will create a state where everyone is honored simply by the fact that they're human. Um, but if you insist on keeping a, a dual... Uh, citizenship with a country that basically favors one race over another, you're not part of our little team here because equal rights don't exist. It's something we all pretend exists, right, by abstracting. So, mm. and, and and to let to let a kind of a, a secondary community, for example, like the professor talked about how in college universities, instead of creating kind of like this, this equal place where everyone can be together and solve problems, we've simply created a different set of studies or different people. Like, well, there's there's lesbian and transgendered studies. There's black studies. There's Asian studies. 
Um, instead of creating a place where everyone can be together in the state, for example, how about what happened? How about what happened in France, um, or is is happening in all parts of Europe and Japan too, where they're like, okay, well, there's this area of Japanese people, and then there's this zone of people that are not Japanese that don't even have Japanese citizenship, right? They're they're kind of citizens of Korea or China, but they're just kind of in these little zones. They're in these small pockets of of, of foreigners in in France, right? That that exist kind of on their own. And we're not going to incorporate them into the whole of France. We're just going to leave these little mini nation states within our nation state. And if I was a conservative, I'd say, no, you have to eliminate them. But you have to keep the promise of providing those people with the exact same rights that any Frenchman would have. Mm. I mean, isn't that, part, isn't that our principle of equality? That's what we do. We abstract every possible principle. And, and Well, we try to. <laughs> we don't do a good job, but... The idea of equality is that we abstract everything into a secondary property except for the fact that you're human. That's what we're doing, I think, and that's what this is. What would you say, like, what, what, what if, what if, like, my crazy kind of uh, some crazy liberally standing guy approached you and said something along the lines of this? Um, kind of a hippie, hippie like kind of guy. Hippie, not hippie, post hippie. Um, he said. Um, Actually, uh, what makes people equal is the fact that they all have some unique quality. We're equal in being different. If, if that sounds strange, if, the, if the wording it like that sounds strange. In other words, that we, we each have our own unique contribution, and that's how we become equal, by each being allowed to make our, our unique contribution. I would say to him, not everybody has a unique contribution, and are you condemning those people without unique contributions to inequality? Mm -hmm. yes. And then I would also so say, uh, okay, and how do you realistically expect me, me to uh, give equal uh, protection to people based on different abilities? I mean, we do try to do this, though. I mean, that's the idea of multiculturalism, mm -hmm. right? Isn't that what where the idea is like, well, we'll just have little bitty mini nation states basically within America. And they'll have their own little traditions and, 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 and culture. And then that'll contribute to the overall diversity and this overall strength of America. Now I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. Except for the part where they if where they these little mini communities may or may not be denying basic human rights. Mm -hmm. Then you then you're out of the game. Right? You've you forfeited your your rights to American citizens. You can be as different as you want, I guess, in America, as long as you play within the bounds of respecting human rights. So and there's like a like, like like a fundament. There's a fundament, like a, a, a rock bottom. I mean, you're, you're talking about the rock bottom. It's the, the rock most bottom. abstract level. Yeah. And then like the, the differences can appear on top of this, but yes. Yeah. I mean, that, I think that's where the world is going if I'm going to be all like Fukuyama, post Hegelian or kind of thing as well. Yeah. Um, basically, in the end, we're going to only be able to play at culture. There will be no true cultures, as in like cultures that can somehow deny your basic human rights, in, in America at any rate. You're allowed to play at being part of a culture. You can wear your, your I don't know, you can use your, your chopsticks one day, you can wear your French spray the next, and I don't know, put on any kind of garb you want to and play at being whatever culture you want. But the rock bottom fundamentals are going to be basic human rights. Mm. And if you don't play that, that game, um, please leave. And I think that's the message of America. And I don't think I totally hate that message. Mm. I think that's what makes America a unique country. Mm. Mm. I guess in that case, when you're talking basic human rights, you're really meaning basic, like, like Ten Commandment type stuff. Stuff thou shalt not kill. Yeah, I mean, this level basic. I mean, I, like, I wouldn't. I don't know. Ten Commandments. Most of them are not. Okay, really all right. On the right, right, but the, the good commandments. The <laughs> yeah, good ones, like, like don't the kill. two, the two in there. Right? Don't, there's like a whopping two. They can, <laughs> you, but yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> The two, yes, the two commandments. The two commandments. And, <laughs> and thou shalt not, not uh, carve graven images, <laughs> and thou shalt have no god before me. Exactly, yeah. those two. Those are the ones I was thinking of. Because the other ones are really meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
I, I don't. I'm. I'm. I might be wrong about this, but I've always felt that this is basically one of the fundamental doctrines of the United States: hate it or love it. Mm. Right? We've kind of abstracted from all these different parts of culture to the point where we, we really. It's almost impossible for us to have, per se. We do have a culture, but it's kind of a so-called quote-unquote universal culture, right? These universal human rights are our basic, maybe perhaps our culture, what we call universal human rights, are our, our, our kind of culture in the world. And if we found someone inside the United States, a group operating within the United States that systematically denied basic human rights to people, we'd have no problem eliminating them, and we have in the past. Um, with force, with, with extreme <laughs> prejudice, we've done so. So, uh, I, yeah, I... I'm gonna come out against human rights. Oh no, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, but I, I just, I guess, I guess there is one, one last thing. I guess, it, I mean, I, I see what you're saying, and I like what you're saying a lot. I guess the, 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 the final point you made would be, um, it, it's very, very easily arguable that there are groups of people who do not, large groups of people who do not support what could be considered fundamental human rights. I mean, if you consider universal health care a fundamental human right, you'll find a vast swaths of people who are against that. So f the final part of my argument is that the people that betrayed, that have betrayed America and have betrayed everything we stand for and are, are the Republicans. Mm. They are the ones that want to take our country, which is based, I mean, okay, this might be an illusion, but based on a universality of humanity, right? that abstracts from everything that is secondary and particular and goes to the straight human core and allows us to be to have these fundamental human rights the republicans are the ones that are betraying us because they want to make us a normal country they want to make us like every other country in the world which basically favors one particular per se racial group or sexually oriented group um, they are the they are the ones they are the betrayers of our ideal and i say to those people traitors Read your damn books. We have lots of books about this stuff. And of course, we all know like the the model for the fundamental human being is Jean Paul Sartre's uh, man. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, like I I can see like a lot of people being uncomfortable with that, and I could see. I mean, if you were to argue to me like Dustin, that's just American culture. I, it would be a long and difficult process to, to argue against that, so I don't know if I could right now. But I think that's the fundamental principle of America, and that's how that's how we've that's how we see ourselves. Don't you think so, both of you? Yeah, I mean, like even if somebody argued on that, I mean, that's it's in a way maybe they could say that, but like these 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 ideas did not come from America. These ideas, these ideas you're talking about have been bubbling throughout all of history uh, for, for, for hundreds of years. So, I, mean, I think from the time of Plato. Yeah, right? I mean, to say it's just an American idea is, is, is limited in scope. Very limited in scope anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. We're just, the one, yeah. We're just the ones who were a country that was young enough when thought was advanced and it's that far enough. Uh, through to actually start on that road. Mm. I, I think every other country has too much historical baggage to do what we did. Mm. Right? Um. So yeah, yeah, I'm down with you. Like, I'm not going to be arguing against uh, human rights today. Mm. <laughs> not today. Not today. Not. not yeah. you know, like, uh, maybe I'll defend Hitler again today. But yeah, that's right. So human rights, I don't know. <coughs> so maybe, maybe I should attack Hitler so you can defend him real quick. Oh, okay. Well, you can get a balance. So this is uh, this is what I love the most, and this is basically two pages in. Um, I love this idea of the summoners and what it summons you to abstract thought, and how this was a prelude to what the dialectic itself is. And I don't know, I loved all of this early part. What do you two think about the summoners? And then please talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, I, all I can say is I can't yeah, talk about anything in yet because Plato refuses to teach me dialectic. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> too me, young. Too. me too. Me <laughs> too. <laughs> <laughs> too young for that. It's too dangerous. You know, you'd get carried away running around in the streets assaulting people and then getting refuted. Come hey, on. I, I, I want to talk about this point, actually. <laughs> this, is, this is another point I have totally agreed with. <laughs> oh, wow. All right, we're going to talk about this, but um, can I just ask, like, let me, can I just throw something, a point of discussion? 
And I mean, if if you think this doesn't apply at all, please say why it doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree. I like this summoner thing. Like I was like, where 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 is my materia? I guess math is the materia of the ancient <laughs> realm, and you can summon forth, you summon forth in the intellect for you know your materia attacks. But um, so right, you you experience this moment where you see the opposite. Or something, it could be its own opposite, or it, it, you can't know, you don't know what it is, your intellect is summoned to, to sort out r raw experience, if you will. Um, didn't, we, didn't we talk about that with horror movies, too? Yes, exactly right. I mean, this is kind of, this is where I took it, and I mentioned this already, but, like, what do you think about this? Like, what if, like, you know, good old David, let's bring in David Hume for a second. Isn't, isn't it interesting that David Hume kind of went in a, in, a, in a different realm? He's like, hey, yeah, there's a book. But when you think about it, it's just a bunch of pages um, and a cover and some paper. It's not one thing. It's many. And yeah. so really, books don't exist. Really. Yeah. He, he kind of went the opposite direction, right? I it's mean, like Heraclitus, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he wasn't summoned to unite it under one concept. So what was Hume's... I mean, was Hume just not... I mean, I guess it's possible to go that way, right? You could be called. You, I mean, your intellect, his intellect was summoned. He it was summoned. Maybe he, maybe he just didn't take it that way. He just eliminated book. So, like, what? Well, why? Why do we have to keep the one? Um, I I don't think I don't know if Plato is going to have no, a good argument close. against this. It's closer to the form. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I guess maybe if Plato like spoke like every day, I, I, I kind of imagine Plato like this. Like, I don't know if this is like a fake image I have played. I just imagine him if he were sitting next to me, he'd say like, "Well, yeah, but you still call it a book, so why?" Um, I mean, I, I mean, it might boil down simply to that, like use of language. Even though I, I don't know, it's really dangerous to take it there. But I have a feeling like he'd be like, "Yeah, but you call it a book." Yeah, I mean, like, I, I. Actually, agree with Hume, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Plato. Like I think Hume is right, or Heraclitus is right to say that it is the many, but we, we have to exist in the world, mm -hmm. right? So maybe it's not going to be eternal truth that we're looking at it's that Plato thinks. Like I'm looking at the form of book, but I think we all really have to have an idea what book is. I think yep. it's really helpful, <laughs> even if it's not an eternal idea. If it's this kind of vague, cloudy idea that Wittgenstein would like, where well, this book is that is book because it looks like other books. Okay, mm -hmm. but that's still it's still something we understand. We have to work with, right? What I mean, What if I were to take it like in this way to like what, what do you, what would you think about this? Like, yeah, maybe the book is like on some level um, many. I, it's atoms and pages and covers and things like this, but you know, what what if what if I was a Plato guy is like, no, the book is made of pages, but what the book is is not what it's, what it's made of. What oh. the book is 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 not you don't understand what a book is from experience. Oh. oh from wow. raw experience. That's not what it is. Yes. Alright. Because if when it's Ability to perform its function as a book like, is a is a result of its being a collection of so the, the various things that it, it is. Mm. If it was you know, a collection of rather than a cover, you had uh, bread, and rather than and pages, you had ham, and it would play a completely different function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, just. Like I kind of feel like I, what you said, like well, function and use, Jesse, and like Dustin, what you mentioned about having to live. In other words, having having to come into relation with it and to use it. I mean, like book. So maybe this would be betraying Plato to a certain extent, like since to say that like I, via our interaction with the the paper and the cover, it becomes book. Like it's not like universal and unchanging. Exactly. I mean, as long as you're not saying there is a form that exists called book. Abstracted out into the top of in somewhere in the universe. Yeah, I'm totally with you there. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, this is kind of where I was. I 
took this because I don't want to throw away Plato's idea, and I don't want to throw away Heraclitus' Heraclitus idea either. I I think we need to keep a little bit of, of both of these. I think yeah, we can we can reason things in both directions. Mm. So clearly, the you know if you're looking for the function, then you you have to to divine into the one. And if you're looking for the structure, you have to divine the midi graphs. Because mm. you know, imagine you know, somebody, if I look at you and say, "Yeah, you're you're not Justin. You're just a c collection of meat and bones, those and other icky stuff." Yeah. yeah, and he is. That's right. If you read Gantz, you know totally, yes. yeah, totally. Or Song of Saya, yeah. if, if you played Song of Saya. It, this is kind of what, what I liked. Wow, I don't want to take this into Wittgenstein, but this is kind of what I liked so much about Wittgenstein. Like, it almost feels like these are different language games, like in, in later Wittgenstein speak. In other words, if you say, just, just in me, I am, I am bones and blood, I mean, it seems like there, there would be a language game in which that would be the correct answer. Mm. Um, but, I mean, like, in, in, like, I mean, if you're just walking down the street and you're like, hey, who are you? I mean, I wouldn't say bones and blood. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, it, that's just not the language game we're, we're in at the moment. Metaphorically, <laughs> bones and blood. <laughs> that, metaphorically, that's pretty cool, actually. I like that. <laughs> bones and blood. So the, but even just like how we experience life, if I don't see you as a collection of bones, I I know, uh, uh, through the study that you are a collection of bones and blood, mm. uh, but you don't see people that way. In yeah, fact, yeah. we actually see that this bones and blood exposed as we're disgusted by it. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I'm not disgusted by seeing a book like in its innards exposed. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on which book. Well, yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, yeah, definitely. I, uh, I know what you mean. Yeah, I don't like you. Don't understand people. I mean, this is why I like Plato's theory of knowledge. Is like there's a lot. Or in order for something to become knowledge, you have to have an understanding of it. I mean, and this is where the, I think this is where this sneaks in, sneaks in or gets in. This this idea of of, of some what something is is not necessarily how it's experienced. Um, it, it's it's it has to do with the intellect, because it, it, it to to have knowledge of something you have to understand what it is. You have to know how it fits into the the whole thing, right? So you don't understand me as flesh and bones. I mean, normally, unless unless we're in a in a class about like medicine, right? I mean, even then, you probably wouldn't. Right? Yeah. I well, mean, unless it, I'm a, a homicidal murderer. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or or you're or you're you're like writing guns. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that that's all I had for the first one. Like, yeah, I like I liked how it kind of like it reminded me of like horror, maybe like in in a deep level, how, how like. It, maybe like when I have three fingers, like when it's just these three. No, it's these three fingers. Uh, when it's just these three fingers, like it's not at the level of horror yet, but it, it could you could easily move it there with something like The Living Dead or corporeal, incorporeal ghosts or something like this. So what is a ghost? I don't know. Uh, I know how you kill them <laughs> with bullets. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. All right, next point. Okay. Uh, I believe after this we get into a long discussion of the kind of studies that the Guardians have to learn, which is mm. mathematics, geometry, what is next after geometry. Um, he actually flies over, and he says there's something in between in, in geometry and astronomy. Yeah, the the third dimension, right? Like harmonics and, is in there. Yeah, then then astronomy and then harmonics. Um, yeah. I don't really know, have much to say about this, um, other than I get what he's after. Again, this kind of universal answer to mm. problems, right? But he's not studying it for the sake of learning specific things. He's studying it for the sake of learning general things. Again, I just want to no notch Plato down one little peg and say that well, that's that is precisely why science is relevant. Science is relevant because it's not particular, right? Mm. Um, science is relevant because it works in different occasions. It's because it works because you can repeat the experiments. So, not down a peg. I like it. 
I have nothing to say about all this mathematical discussion. Nothing at all. Me too. Um, nothing. Yeah. I'm just thinking where, you know, where's trigonometry? <laughs> that wasn't invented yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I like how isn't it cool how he said like the third dimension? We haven't even gotten to figuring that out yet. I was like, wow. <laughs> it's it's they haven't figured that out yet. That's that's awesome. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's that's a long time ago. Anyway. Yeah. Um well, then we get of course, you know, if you go to Akihabara, there are still people who haven't figured that out. No, no, no. And I think gladly, I think they would say. Um, I, th I think they've gone from the third dimension to the second dimension. Uh, <laughs> some, some, some even to the first dimension. Um, so after this is the Song of Dialectic, which yeah. I don't have much to say about, but I, it's interesting to try to piece together what 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 what. Plato thinks dialectic is. Mm, I that was kind of what I was sitting around doing most of the time. But didn't you think just generally, just on a very general level, like the tips, the things he talked about learning, uh, the dialectic. I think there's generally good advice. A free man ought not to learn any study slavishly. Um, yeah, right. I mean, when you're forced to read Lord of the Flies when you're in high school, it doesn't stick. You read you read Lord of the Flies when you get out of high school. It's a really awesome book. Um, don't use force. Use play. Play with the kids. I mean, it's just good advice. Play sticks. Um, kids should learn their stu how their studies relate with one another. Then it sticks. I mean, that, that I mean that really does. I mean, that's just generally good education advice. And I mean, I, I think it just it resonates with his general theory of needing knowledge of the good. Because I mean, all of these things like don't use force. Play. Don't make do don't learn anything slavishly. Uh, relate your studies to their studies. I mean, this is I, I think it fits in with the idea of the good. In other words, like I mean, if you're forced to learn something, you, you just kind of you memorize enough to get by. At least that's what I did, right? Like, if you really hate it, you're just like, oh God, what do I need to know? Okay, this, this, and this. I mean, you don't you don't move from correct belief to knowledge in Plato's sense because you don't make the effort to understand it which means you, you don't make the effort to, to incorporate it into your world, which means you, you don't see it in the light of the good. You don't apply reason directly to it. And I, I, know, I just liked, in general, how, how Plato's theory of the good fits in with, which is, general, I think, generally good advice about how to study. Yeah, I, I particularly liked, I think, of all of them, what I kind of feel is really important is how what dialectic is supposed to do is bringing out associations between your fields of study. Mm. I think that really does affect your feeling towards education. Because I think when we were, when we grew up, I, we both kind of felt like education was kind of like a game show. Yeah. Where you kind of connected. Mm. But when you start learning like even interstudy things or philosophy, which connects different areas of study into one kind of big system... Even even areas of study you didn't think were interesting at all suddenly become fascinating, and you can see how each one of them relates to each other. I don't know. That really makes education stick with you. Um, I, don't know, I like that. Yeah, that's the only way you survive Plato's harmonics class, by the way. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Day fifty-seven of harmonics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you like you learn learning harmonics for like ten years, and you're like, well, what can I do with it? Don't you dare ask that. Don't you dare. <laughs> like how beautiful harmonics is. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, I guess I, I guess you don't have a gold soul. <laughs> I mean, like I guess the one thing that I I, I understand, I get it, but it it seems tricky is this idea that dialectic can survive all refutation. Uh, which um I, I get it, like you have to be able to articulate what you understand, which is a very good idea. Even actually articulating what you understand can actually lead you to further understanding about it, and you can actually become clear about even your own contradictions. However, sometimes you can lose to a well... a, a person who's good at deceiving or, or at clever at, at making logical fallacies, which is actually another kind of lesson. But, mm -hmm. Um... Yeah, in general, you kind of you, you want to believe that your argument can res can survive all refutation. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what what do you think? Uh, just just give me your 
I want to just throw this at you, by the way, about the, the dialectic. Tell me what you think about this. Um, maybe I was thinking way too much about Schopenhauer as I was reading today this re- this book. But so maybe Anas pointed out how like seemingly, maybe not not so, but seemingly Plato has two visions of the dialectic that seem to com- contradict each other. So he has this number one. He has the vision number one, who is where you need to give and receive, give and receive an account of the object of dialectic. And you have to be able to say what each object of study really is. So this is something articulate. You have to, there's conversation, there's verbal exchange, it's, it's dialectic, right? It's, it's conversation. So there's this one. And then there's, there's vision number two, which is he, his constant use of the imagery of vision and grasping in the sun, in the line, in the cave. Knowledge is, is turning toward the light. But see, in this vision, right, knowledge is nonverbal, not articulate. It's something like you do all by yourself. You look at the light of the sun, and you become enlightened somehow by grasping in a vision what the truth is. And I mean, really, how could arguing with someone help you to see? How you, arguing doesn't help you to see the sun. Um, so it, she kind of puts these two and says, like, seemingly these contradict each other. And then she tries to re- resolve this a little bit. Um, what if? What do you? What, just tell me what you think about this. Is my way of res- resolving this. I don't know if this is right or not, but what if I said, like, num- uh, first vision, the vision number one, where you have to give and receive a certain account, and you you engage in conversation, uh, and you have to say what the object of study is? Wow. Let's roll with me on this. This is what's happening on the outside. And the, the, the sun, the line, and the cave, where knowledge is focusing you turning on the light, is what's happening on the inside of you while you're doing the first one. I mean, ideally. So as you are discussing, as you are engaging in the dialectic, the, the words you use, the articulation you use, is making a change inside of you. where And, and you are incorporating what you're hearing into a larger schema of understanding. So, like, the cave and the sun and the line are kind of like an inner vision. I guess, wow, Schopenhauer. I guess it would be like the will, and the dialectic and the conversation would be the representation on the out, happening on the outside of you. What do you think about that? Would that do, you, do you like that? Do you hate it? I don't know. <laughs> I like it. Uh, I, I like it as hard as there's, um, well, through engaging in dialectic with someone, you know, you're articulating your point, points, you're ha- having this this back and forth, and in this back and forth, there is, you know, you're kind of each throwing out. If you're both practicing dialectic properly, mm. you know, in other words, having a civilized conversation, you're slowly advancing the conversation to the right end, mm. and it, 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 you know, as you two are, you know, you, you two are bo- are on the boat in. A form of this conversation, which is being being sailed towards the truth, with it, this proper dialectic was kind of how I saw. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I like that. I, I kind of, I was kind of, I have similar vision. What what would you think about just like <clears throat> the metaphor of the cave? I mean, the guy in the cave <clears throat> is all alone. He's looking at the sun. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, like how should I say? It? It, so maybe, like, somebody got him out of the cave. Uh, yeah, right, the guy tapped, pull, pulled him up and, and pushed him out of the cave. Mm. But, like, he's okay. outside, and, like, he he has to do this, right? He has to do this. He has to start. He has to get get ready. He has to prepare himself to look at the sun. Just like, like early, early, too, like, Cephalus and the other guy, Paulo Marcus, have to have an inner understanding, even if they're right sometimes. If yeah, they don't yeah. have this like inner understanding, yeah. they don't really get it, right? Yeah. I think is one of his points. Yeah, this is kind of this is where I was. I want to take this like somehow like the good is here, right? Like knowledge of the good is 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 the incorporation. Maybe so. Maybe we're engaging in dialectic, and maybe everything we're saying is correct. We we could say we could just say a mountain of truths, but it it it, it would just turn out to be like Cephalus and Polemarchus. I mean, if it's just like I'm just repeating memorized sentences, like 
the, the that's not knowledge for Plato. Anyway, it's, it's I I haven't mm. incorporated this in, in, into my scheme of understanding the world. Right, it, it would just be these like arbitrary <laughs> outward truths that I just repeat back at you. Mm. Yeah, so but, I mean, yeah. hopefully the conversation would do that to me, right, Jesse? I know what you mean. Like, the whole yeah. conversation would get me to, on the inside, be, like, making these connections. I was kind of, like, my, my only last... My, actually, my last point here was going to be like this. Yeah, right. I mean, and Anas brings this up, where how Plato writes using dialogues because in dialogue, um, ideas are... She says, ideas are given a point. Or, or maybe, like... In conversation, you are called on to answer in a way that you're not called on to answer in a book, right? In other words, you have to engage and you have to incorporate your answers into a larger scheme. And you can't just sit back and be like, yeah, give me the knowledge, bro, right? I mean, and then you just like memorize it, right? And so di in, in this engaging in dialogue, you are forced upward because you are called on to answer. Yeah, because... Because if you're, you're just passively observed, and you're not actually, you know, poking holes at your own worldview. I could say, say, yeah, yeah, that's right, oh, that's right, that's right. I agree with everything. And you say yes, yes. Uh, so what you say is very fi fine. Just lead. Mm -hmm. I am one who wants to listen. So a very long preamble for for one who wants to listen. So so man, Glasshot's an idiot. But uh, <laughs> um, or at least he's not. Very active in the conversation, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but <laughs> and like, don't you think just in general, like, don't you feel just apart from Plato, leaving Plato out of this, don't you feel this is intuitively true? And in, in like, in what we do, in 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 this, like, when when you talk about what you're thinking, mm. and you have to answer questions about it, like, I feel it sticks so much more. Because yeah, actually, this I don't want to bring in in Oza. We, was all we can do is too much here. I haven't <laughs> talked about it recently. Oh. <laughs> but, but, uh, because you, oftentimes you don't even really know what you think. Yeah, yes, I totally agree with that. Totally, yeah. You know, I, maybe, maybe in this conversation, I'm surprised with my own, own response. Perhaps you mm. in surprised, shocked, but is is surprised in a negative way. They shocked my own response. That, but the fact that I said it, it when this was pressure on me, it means that somewhere deep down, down in my soul, there is the this belief or this element there, there, and these kind of things you don't realize about yourself, mm. of, of come to light when you you're put on the spot in conversation when you. Or you know, again, when the the Ozawa and dualism in terms, when the the reactive self is functioning as opposed to the passive self. Mm, 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 mm. I I totally agree. Yeah, I I like that a lot. I mean, you don't really know what you think sometimes until you engage in some kind of dialogue, some kind of conversation, some kind of active pursuit. Right. So that kind of makes knowledge almost kind of like an exercise. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like gymnastic. Yeah, it's <laughs> gymnastic. <laughs> well, they spend so long doing that stupid gymnastic. And maybe, they, maybe there's, maybe that's the connection. I don't know. That's a long time doing gymnastic, by the way. I'm just saying, like, that's a lot of gymnastic. I, I don't know. I just don't know what Plato picture they'd be doing. But like in in modern times, they'd just be playing dodgeball, like for like 20 <laughs> years, right? Like make them play dodgeball for 20 years, and then they'll be ready to engage. Um. The only thing I can kind of make of that is, is in engaging in gymnastic, like you're gaining a solid, you know, tactile, uh, uh, empirical uh, understanding of the physical world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can play ball. Woo, yeah, and that's what everybody's saying, like all the young kids. Like they'd, everything they'd say would be like sports metaphors. You're out, safe. Uh, maybe it's actually not so different from kids nowadays, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. I just I I the the age the age diff the age is so long. It's just like yeah, I understand some people need a long time to cook, but like 
give him a little hints. Come on, like that's a long time. Like give give him a little bit more than than just gymnastic man. Kind of. And there was that really interesting section in there where he talks about how like you know you you kind of get cocky and you go off. And I mean, this is obviously what people who were following Socrates around were doing, right? They would study, look at Socrates, and try to copy him. And then they 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 learn on some superficial superficial level what he was doing, and then they go off and try to refute people. And then they get refuted. Then like you know, or maybe what Socrates was doing to other people, right? They would. I mean, it always reminded me of Kaufman's decidophobia, like. You get refuted, and you're like, "Well, screw it. I don't know what what's true anymore. So I'm just gonna do with. I'm just gonna believe whatever makes me feel the happiest." I could totally see that happening, but I mean, I I just feel like I I would have started teaching kids a little younger how to reason. Mm. Than yeah, he I was, does. Though it was kind of uh, there. I thought there was a little bit of a sinister undertone towards it. To this dialect, no dialect until you're 30 thing. Because he's like, okay, you know, these people, well, they'll go out and they'll, they'll ref be refuted, then, and they'll be refuting things just for the fun of it. I won't know it's true anymore, and then they'll just do whatever the hell they want to. to. But there, if you remember the metaphor that goes into this, this he said, you know, what if, you know, somebody who you know, they've believed in something thing up in their entire lives, then it gets refuted, and then they just are like, okay, fuck it, I'm lawless less now. I have no law. You know, I don't care for anything. Thing. And, which this seems... seems... I don't know, his whole thing about dialectic seems contrary to the pursuit of knowledge, because it seems like he's wanting you... The reason why he put that, that 30 line... Is because that's when people start getting stubborn. Mm. So once you, you know, uh, the the what he doesn't want them to to get he doesn't, he doesn't want to get refuted and then have them give up on is the you know, the noble lie and the justice of the city. Ah, uh, that's interesting reading. That's so a kind of a more cynical reading, but yeah. Yeah. So he's afraid that if they're starting in to discuss too early, the they might be find a way to refute this, mm. so that wouldn't be good. So once they're thirty, we they're just gonna, you know, their line of conversation at the city is gonna be like, so the city's just right. Uh, yep. Okay, I'm glad we proved that dialectically. Let's move on. <laughs> I kind of, in a weird way, in a really cynical way, I kind of get Plato's pessimism about young kids. Like, you get people who believe stuff without having thought it through and they think they've refuted the whole thing, the whole shebang, when actually there is a lot more thought going on behind them than they ever realized. But I don't know, Dustin, you said you wanted to talk about this age gap thing, didn't you? Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm with you in like teaching I think kids should learn how to reason and most of all kids nowadays need to learn about um, how, how to do media criticism well. Mm. I, that's the that's the most necessary skill they need, and they're not being taught how to how to rationally and calmly look at what the media is doing to them or the messages that the, it's giving them. I admit that. I guess I, I guess the only thing I can say is I understand Plato's cynicism because don't you think the culture of hate on the internet the, this this culture of hate. I mean, there's there's, an, there's a legitimate, I think, culture of hate on the internet, and the reason for that is this very reason, uh, mm -hmm. that people kind of feel that they don't, if they try to stand up for something, they're going to get mowed down. Uh. So basically, they're like, everything sucks, man, and it becomes this kind of, well... Or they see a really good critic, for example. They see a really good, interesting critic. For example, Red Letter Media. And then they decide that they're just going to copy him and just, just willy-nilly call everything stupid. Whereas Red Letter Media doesn't think that for a minute. right? Um, they have a more subtle, nuanced vi vision of movies and cinema. right? And if you actually watch his, his Half in the Bag series, right, you'll see that... If you don't have a proper understanding of where he's coming from, you take his, his thoughts and ideas too seriously. You think that he's totally dismissing everything. And th these people kind of take this surface reading, which is why they need to learn media criticism, most of all. They take a surface reading of his critical analysis, 
and they just basically go on to criticize everything and say, well, everything sucks, everything's stupid, right? And then you get a, basically a, just kind of a, a universal culture of hate on the Internet. Mm. Um, and it comes from this idea that, well, you can't defend anything. And then you get this, this absurd idea that, like, everything sucks, and and you get these kind of people that just go around that are angry, right? Everything's angry, and and everything sucks. And, and everything that gets high views on the internet is about how something sucks or is terrible or a ponage video, right? That's the that's the kind of culture, a kind of very cynical, a very cynical view. Person with cynical view would would kind of encourage, right? don't you think? Mm. Well, isn't that more the reason why they uh, should have dialectic? Because they'll. This seems to be a a result of people not uh, knowing what it is to actually engage in a in a civilized conversation. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that for the most part, a lot of these people are engaged in a conversation at all. Mm. I don't think that they're even trying to be engaged in a conversation. Um, they're out to either score a few quick points and to prove how awesome and cool they are, and that's it. It's not a conversation about the truth. It's look how many free points I can score off of you on the YouTube comments. You suck. Didn't watch. Too long, right? Didn't read. Okay. All this is is basically like, I'm so cool. Like, meh, or whatever, right? I mean, the, all these comments and all these things are is, I'm too cool for school for you. It was not never a dialectic from the get-go. It was just simply a game to one-up each other. That's it. That's all it is. That's that's what breeds a culture of hate. Hmm. But perhaps if they had, if they had been taught the the value and necessity and the practice of dialectic, like perhaps perhaps they would have found a different way to do this. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem like they're trying to reach agreement or even trying to find something that's worth defending. Mm. It seems like what most people are after is trying to find a way to feel good about themselves, mm. right? It's this kind of closed-in world of non-truth, mm. right? They're more interested in feeling good, and the way they feel good is by knocking other people down. And mm. that's the extent of their exploration of the world, right? Mm. It doesn't extend into, or at least... As an, I mean, this is too much of a generalization about the internet, but perhaps later on these people do start extending their hands out further towards what they consider to be a good, I don't know, movie or game or book or novel or anything. But for the most part, it kind of seems like mm. the culture of everything sucks rules the day. And then everyone kind of feels ashamed for liking the things they like, right? Oh, my, 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 my guilty pleasure, right? People started talking about guilty pleasures. Well, I have this guilty pleasure. I liked Gremlins or something, all right? I mean, that comes from this kind of, I don't know, this inability, first of all, to actually defend yourself. And then they, they kind of feel like, well, there's nothing really good. So, yeah, I know what I like sucks, but I like it anyway. It's, it comes with this guilty feeling, right? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Does that come from... I wonder if that, that guilty feeling about loving things, too, comes from the fact that they think that there's a good, that, but they just don't have any possible way of justifying their own idea of it, or that they never even thought about the good themselves at all. Um, maybe, maybe it's that, is that they don't even know what the good is at all, and they just assume that it's out there, but they don't have any method or way of getting there. So they think what they like sucks, and of course what everyone else likes sucks. But there's no discussion. There's no... It's just a game, and it's a game to score points. And I, that's not everybody on the internet, obviously. But it seems like that's a stage that a lot of children go through. Mm -hmm. right? they, they discover a critic they like that just destroys something that probably needs destruction. And then they try to use this same method on things that are a little more subtle, right? and it doesn't go as well. And they look like a fool, and then they get even more cynical from that or drop it, I don't know. I, it seems like I've seen this process more than once on the internet, and I think the internet does have a very, especially the gaming community. I mean, as, as has been talked about in many recent videos, has a culture of just hate. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wonder, I mean, like, I, I think, cause I, I totally agree with what you say, but um, part of it, I think, has to do, maybe you kind of mentioned this, is like Plato mentions how in dialectic, you you give an account 
of what something is. I think people really can't give an account about why they like something. Yeah, I think that too, right? Maybe that is it. Is it they can't give an account of they why like they it, like yeah. Gremlins. They like it, but right? they can't give an account of why they like it. They don't know why they do what they do. And, and then someone says, them, like, yeah. and then someone says, like, you suck. That is such a stupid, childish movie. How could yeah. you like that? Yeah. You know, and then you're kind of taken aback on how to defend yourself. Maybe yeah. you do need to have a kind of weapon or at least an idea of the good mm. to, to not to not feel this constant guilt about loving the things you do. I think people feel disarmed in the intellectual realm. And I mean, and this is why people, I think, sometimes really do get cynical. Um, to 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 defend themselves, they get cynical about intellectual pursuit in general. Yeah. I mean, they they consider this kind of effete, meaningless little word word game where what really counts is like what people really like. I think to defend themselves against their lack of intellectual firepower because mm -hmm. they, they they get taken surprise by surprise when every and whenever anyone analyzes something like analyzing equals taking the fun out of it, analyzing equals ruining it. So perhaps the are we coming to the opposite conclusion that it's because of a lack of study in media criticism or even having a, an idea of the good or what a good thing is that that's what generates this kind of defensiveness is that mm -hmm. where we're going here I mean there there is of course the I mean I I do think what what the, the Socrates says is right in general in, in young kids that they do try to copy or Plato says they do try to copy maybe Socrates and they get refuted and they get frustrated, mm. but maybe in general when when you, when you're made to feel guilty about things you like, I mean that 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 is also why I do think about the things I like and I'm ready for with answers as to why I like them. Now I don't know if that's yeah. a good way to live or not, but. I, I think it does help me kind of better see what even I'm about. I really, yeah, I'm, I have a really difficult time imagining what Plato is thinking here about like these these kids who are not getting the dialectic. So, I mean, obviously some of them are going to think about this stuff, right? They're going to ask these questions. So what... I mean, prepared for them, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the the dialectic probably it will happen it just because people are talking, no? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, but there are people that don't believe that philosophy is even useful at all. It's True, not, yeah. it's not it's not even worth talking about if for example, even what's good or not. That's yeah. just useless. There are some crazy Athenians too. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what got they're they're out there. The cynics are out there. Yeah. I mean, that, that's not to say that everyone is. I actually think that, in general, people do have an idea, but it's basically a, an idea handed down to them by, I don't know, the authority that, that is, which is basically the media itself. Mm. The media tells them what is cool, and then they just kind of bark that out. If a, or maybe, like, their, their local community, if they're able to find some local community, they kind of just believe that whatever fits in with that local community, and then that's it. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems to like a very unreflective idea about what it is and why, what they like. Mm. I, I wonder, I, I don't know, do you, I, I, I personally am kind, of, kind of leading in the opposite direction, like kid, kids need to engage and, and, and try this process. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wonder, maybe, is, maybe do we need to strive some kind of balance? I, I kind of, I don't know... I, I get the cynicism, I really do, but I, it just feels like, I mean, after reading Kaufman, after reading someone like Kaufman, like, Kaufman s articulates this so well. It, I mean, if you if you read Kaufman, it's difficult to actually make that mistake anymore because you realize how much of a mistake it is just, just saying, well, I was refuted, so anything's okay. I mean, that's just, that's just such an outright flaw in thinking. I mean, if, if we could just, like, cover these grounds with people... Um, and because you refute it doesn't mean you can believe anything you want. Uh, I, I I don't know. I think you could teach that. You could just as yet maybe when kids are young try try to get them versed in this stuff, this kind of thinking. Yeah, because yeah. if not, yeah, they're gonna get refuted. And if I like Gremlins and somebody says so that's stupid, then and just right with our example, well that's gonna happen. Yeah. Then. 
whether I have dialectic or not. Yeah. I do have dialectic. Like I might be a little bit more prepared to handle it, which would keep me from going down this bad path. Yeah. If I had realized that, you know, sorry, the guy who's saying that's stupid, that he's actually the one who's who is cause who has the logical fallacy going on here. Mm. Well, it's not a logical fallacy. He's the one, but he's the one speaking from fallacy. See. <laughs> Yeah, and that his opinion is believing his opinion is fact. Mm. Yeah, I was trying to I imagine guess. these fifty year olds, fifty year olds who know the dialectic too. Are they just <laughs> not engaging with everyone else? Like I just sometimes I try to imagine like the city and you know, like I for a while I was imagining like they'd be like they'd be like intellectual giants and they'd be walking around and like the kids would like try to come up with them and they'd just clean their clocks, but like the, the kids aren't supposed to be exposed to the dialectic. So, like, I guess there's silence towards these kids. So, yeah, the kids come up and they'd say, and they'd say what do you think about, about love? He's like, no dialectic. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is love? Did I hear some dialectic? <laughs> it's 20 laps. It's 20 <laughs> laps. That's more gymnastic for you. <laughs> I, I think that's what it would happen. <laughs> you have the dialectic police. You know, when we were growing up and going to school, uh, you know, everybody's like, like no swearing. <laughs> like I said, they'd be like no dialectic. <laughs> then, like when you walk into a store and like you, the people hear you speaking the dialectic, they, they do like an ID check, like when you buy alcohol. <laughs> like, sorry, sir, can I see your ID? That sounds like dialectic. Oh, you're over fifty. Okay, right. We card everyone who looks up to sixty just to be safe, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I'll be the uh, kind of the devil's advocate here, uh, just to to see where we can go with this. So, I I really do think the kids need to learn about at least basic logic errors and media criticism, especially because I think it's one of the most influential things in their life. Mm. But what age do you seriously think a kid should start reading Nietzsche? Three, don't uh, tell don't tell me you think a kid at at fifteen should start even reading. Not even fifteen should start reading Nietzsche. Really? I mean, maybe they could. But what age do you really think they're going to start to understand Nietzsche? I mean, like, if I were setting up curriculum, um, we wouldn't get to Nietzsche until we've read the Bible, until we've read Plato, until we've read Kant, until we've read some Schopenhauer. I mean, I mean, read. I mean, I mean, like, read and thought about. I mean, that alone. It's like, that's that's years and years of reading first. Uh, yeah, I mean, don't you think a little life experience is necessary oh, for yeah. Nietzsche? Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so what, what age would you recommend people begin to read Nietzsche at? Oh my God, I hate to put an age limit on this kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, it's going to depend on the individual, of course. So you uh, think ten-year-olds? There's like this ten-year-old who's who's ready to start reading um, Beyond Good and Evil. <laughs> that would be hilarious. I mean. I, it, would, I, it would almost seem like a joke if he if he was reading it. Like to me, I mean, I, I almost be tempted to say like, yeah, go nuts. I don't think you'll get anything out of it. Um, but I mean, at least wait till he's fifteen or sixteen before like in, in serious any kind of any kind of it can be engaged on in in, in any serious level. I would think, but mm. so that, philosophy too. Too early, you can become the vicious philosopher. Mm. I mean, there are these kids that go to the you know the atheism board on Reddit, and then they're like, "Oh, God is dead. I hate God." And then they go to these, you know, they go to those Facebook posts, and they're like, "My friend died. Like, oh, there's no God. Stupid." <laughs> so, well, my mom tells me I have to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that. I hate my mom for making me to go to go to church. <laughs> I mean, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, like, I'm not saying that's why we shouldn't teach killed children dialectic, of course. I'm just saying it does happen. I don't mm. think they get, they get a little carried away. So I think maybe when you teach dialectic or, or philosophy, like, it really, <laughs> it has to be taught well. Mm. It has to be taught with nuance. I mean, what, what do you think about this? Like, maybe can I offer uh, just a little bit more optimistic vision? I mean, like, like, I don't know about teaching and if it were actually curriculum, per se, but maybe I would wait. I would really, like, lay out a curriculum that would allow for an understanding of somebody like Nietzsche, but I mean, just letting them read it, I think, I mean, I think you could, you could easily destroy their reading of Nietzsche really fast. I mean, I, is it, do you think, isn't that enough? You're like, you don't, you don't understand the first thing about Nietzsche. 
give me what you got. And that would be enough. No? Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I, I get, that's why I think it, if you teach philosophy, it needs, it needs proper nuance. Mm. Mm. Oh, which hopefully you can get with a dialectic. Right? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, you know, well, with philosophy, there's definitely a jacurendo you need, you need for certain books. Mm. I'm sorry, I'm, you know, me and my daughter, we sometimes work through the tractates together. She's, <laughs> <not> <laughs> getting, right, she's right, just right. not getting it. Yeah, well, <laughs> that'll happen. She's like, "Come on, honey, the objects. You don't, you don't get this. The, these objects <laughs> need to be possibly in." Combination, possibly, mind you. Yeah, uh, I uh, I don't know. I don't. Uh, maybe I, maybe children copying philosophers is actually the beginning of their road down to truth. I don't know. Maybe maybe actually that vision of the critic actually gives them hope that there is something to be said about the good. I don't know. Maybe I mean maybe it's yeah maybe it's just like the meat factory. I mean it it looks disgusting, but like you really get a really good sausage at the end. So I don't know. Just just imagining it like it is kind of bleh. like imagining this ten year old cracking open Beyond Good and Evil. Meh. But I don't know. Maybe maybe it have the a good effect on him. Yeah. The only thing concerned be he sometimes once you you know same with once you learn something. Thing, a skill, skill. It's hard to if you say you know you learn a judo throw uh, incorrectly. Mm. It's very hard to fix. Uh. And the same things go with you know, um, you know if you watch a movie, the you know you, you, even when you're watching a movie sometimes you mishear a line, you know, and you remember it as that you, even though you're watching it and you're hearing him say something different, your mind is still creating that. That line as what you initially misheard it as. There's this concern that if people are not ready for certain aspects of philosophy, they will misread the things and then they will be unable to shake that misreading. Mm. What, what do you think about? I kind of like, wow, when, not you mention that. I kind of like where this, where you're taking this, but what if I just said, like, in, 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 in another way, though, like, what, what if they're already. Listening to their, their 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 dumb parents who are telling them like really stupid things like you gotta you gotta get the get rid of the gays because they're ruining the, the Americas, the true yeah. liberty of the Americas. I mean, it, maybe their 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 parents' influence might be crappy enough. I mean, who knows? A couple of lines, uh, you know, a couple of lines out of Beyond Good and Evil, a couple of lines out of like David Hume's in Inquiry into Human Understanding, like that. Man. It might be enough to actually like short circuit some of the things their the crazy crap their parents are telling them. This is actually one of the reasons I thought we need mm. maybe at least dialectic because mm. they are going to have their parents and saying this shit. And if they're trying, you know, and some of these things, you know, the gays, the gays are ruining everything. Like, mm. This is pretty easily refuted. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, when, when these kids who oh, are just refuting things for the fun of it, which yes, they would do the, this. Is mm. They'll refute that, mm, mm, mm. Yeah. and at least they'll know that's not true. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just want to ask one last question then about this idea. So, um, so Socrates kind of here suggests that it's dangerous to teach children philosophy because they're going to go off and, and perhaps I don't know what he thinks they're going to do. They're going to refute Be the become, justice of the city. Yeah, they're going to yes. refute the justice, become criminals or something, I <laughs> yeah, guess. Yeah. Lawless. Um, lawless. I mean, I mean, as, as much kind of sympathy, I guess, I have for that argument is, you know, when I see pathetic arguments on YouTube, and that's the best sympathy I've got for him because it, they can. that's the best they can do. But doesn't this contradict his other argument that the greatest teacher – of people are the the masses, right? They are the greatest sophists. Mm. I mean, like, and that that's the thing. That's the same feeling I get with religious people. They're like, well, if you didn't believe in God, you know, I would just be out there raping every woman I saw. Well, no, you wouldn't. You would just be following the crowd anyway, right? I mean, because the crowd teaches you. Um, so you know, you're not this dangerous tiger. You're just a follower. 
So it's not as if religion's keeping you in check. I mean, how do you think that relates to his idea that the crowd is what teaches you and moves you? And in, in, I believe in that exact passage, he's like, what can one philosopher do in the face of one crowd, right? Mm. Um, and then here he's kind of a little bit more hesitant about teaching young kids dialectic. Mm. How do you think those two ideas match together? No, <laughs> and, actually, um, I, now you know, I wonder what his extent of dialectic is, because some people never get dialectic. Mm -hmm. And maybe he's thinking that if you take dialectic away from people, well, uh, you know, again, you know, the parents and and saying, yeah, the gays are ruining everything. And if he includes that under dialectic, like, then maybe that he just wants to, like remove the ability for anybody who's lacks proper knowledge to even state an opinion. Mm. Which would, well, considering the, what he does to his bronze people, I wouldn't put it past him. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that way, he's that way you'd essentially silence the masses, so that your one um, gold philosopher king in his fifties, who has who has this dialectic power, who's able to articulate things, so that even these idiots who know nothing can can understand it, then he would be pretty powerful. Mm. Well, if the masses are stripped of their voice. Yeah. I kind of yeah yeah. I like that. And yeah, Dustin, directly answering your question, I like the previous version. I like the, the one about the, the masses being the true sophist, who are the ones controlling and molding people. I mean, I think that's, I find that true to life. I mean, I get it, like, yeah, maybe some, you meet some guy and he has a really big influence on your life. Socrates had a big influence on That does happen. I, I see that even on, you know, in my life. I've seen it around me, on YouTube. I mean, you can just see it. It does happen. Mm. I just don't think it happens at the extent. I mean, the worst that can happen is a bunch of people hating on each other on YouTube, right? Dissing each other and trashing each other for what they like or like. I don't, I don't even know if that's true anymore. But when it comes to your actual life... I really think that your peer group is going to have almost absolute control of how you're going to turn out. I mean, it's possible you're going to meet Socrates on the street one day and he's going to say to you, what, what is justice? And you're going to be confused. And you might be that one kid in a million that drops out of the war because Socrates convinced you that you weren't fighting the just war. I think most of the kids are going to be like, screw you, Socrates. I'm going to fight Sparta. And that would have been the end of it. Man. There wouldn't even have been a discussion. I like how, like, the Euthyphro, the dialogue the Euthyphro ends. He's kind of like, oh, yeah, Socrates, I'd love to talk to you about holiness, but whoa, I gotta go. Uh, <laughs> Look at the time. Uh, yeah, I, I'm late for persecuting my father. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> I have a feeling that's what happened to a lot of people who were talking to Socrates anyway. <laughs> Alright, so, yeah. Okay. Perhaps, I don't know, I've really started to rethink my idea about the culture of hatred. Perhaps even a culture of hatred exists because people have an idea of what people should like. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. All right, that can be saved for a different time when we talk about internet culture and games. Um, anything else you want to say about this? I think we're just about up. I'm pretty good. No, I'm done, yeah. All right, so how about as a question to our, our viewers? There is, again, thank you very much for sitting through with us on this journey. Me, for me, I have a very important question. It kind of gets to the, really the heart of this of this book and perhaps the entire the Republic to begin with. But, but this is a, largely a conversation between Plato and Glaucon. Um, but there's also... Uh, well, not Plato, sorry. God, Socrates and Glaucon. On... <laughs> um, 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 but there's also one of Plato's brothers, Adam Adamantius, or whatever his name is. Why hasn't he said anything recently? <laughs> That's your question. <laughs> He's too um, busy, like, sticking out the knives from his hands. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't think that Plato thinks he's smart enough to talk about the highest levels. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, maybe, maybe I feel like like he jumps in when it comes to like consequences and discussions of consequences. Maybe he's like a consequences kind of guy, and like Glaucon's kind of like a thing in itself kind of guy. Yeah, but yeah, anybody who wants to to offer an opinion on that, that's 
<laughs> uh, we look forward to, to reading them down in the comments. <laughs> Where did he go? <laughs> questions for our... Where is he? What, what do you imagine him doing? Does he have a yo-yo? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, what are they doing? I mean, Jasimicus, what's he doing? Yeah, what's he doing? <laughs> I imagine him eating grapes. I don't know why. I, I imagine him eating a turkey leg. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. 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 I think he's sitting there, there, and he's he's off with Paul Marcus in the other the room because remember he um we got to women. Yes. He's the one who kind of like is like like he didn't talk about women and get him Paul Marcus, get him Paul Marcus. <laughs> He's sitting there with Paul and Marcus, and they're both very frustrated. <laughs> Paul and Marcus thinking, "Why the fuck did I call this guy? Why did I have my slave stop him?" And and the Smith is like, like well, yeah, that's just that Socrates he thinks is so great. I mean, it's supposed to be complaining about Socrates. He's, he's just waiting for those moments where you go, like, Paul Marcus, get him, get him, because <laughs> he's done arguing directly. <laughs> All right, and I have a question. If there are any people out there listening, which, who knows, um, if there are any summoning moments you've ever faced, what 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 moment have you thought was like a, a good summoner for you? What what made you think abstractly? What movie? What TV show? What game made you think about the nature Ooh. of of reality? The nature. This of question. Oh. Oh oh, this this question was this a summoner. Video. Oh <laughs> yes. <laughs> it made me question the nature of YouTube videos. Uh, <laughs> it looks really bad, but... <laughs> All righty then. Excellent question. Please. Please. All righty then. Let's sign off then. It's been way too long already. All right. Next week, book eight, probably.